So the Bible is a spiritual book for spiritual people, for spiritual living. Can't study it in carnality. Evidence of carnality is personal sin. Could be mental attitude sins, sins of the tongue, or vert sins. Your responsibility as a believer priest under the new covenant is to confess sin and privacy prior to study. 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us. This cleansing restores you to spirituality. It's not a salvation issue. It's a spirituality issue. The Holy Spirit has given you to teach you the truth of the word of God. And that's it. That's why it's so important. So I give you a moment of silence to take care of that type of business. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you tonight for these who have come our way by automobile and internet. Pray the Holy Spirit would minister the truth of the Word of God to our souls. We discuss, Father, divine wisdom. James has instructed us about two spheres of wisdom. There's the cosmic system called the demonic, and there's the divine system, the Word of God. So I pray, Father, tonight that the Holy Spirit would minister the truth to our souls about the divine wisdom. Wisdom. Not learning the Bible, but having the practical insight of the Word of God in our soul at a mature part of our life where we can apply it wisely and understandably. For we pray in our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Here we are in... And James, now, I was told that I put Sunday on there, and I did. Of course, it's not Sunday. So you might change that to Wednesday, because it is Wednesday. And here we are in the book of James. And we're in the third chapter, and I'm looking at 17 and 18. You recall that. He introduced us to these two spheres of wisdom in the, wor in the world. One is the demonic and one is divine. And he begins this discussion in verses 13. He goes through verses 8 through verse 18. He introduces this in verse 13. Who among you is wise and understanding? Wise and understanding are two keys to divine wisdom for the application of it. Who among you is wise and understanding? He's going to call this the people that can apply wisdom to their life on all occasions under enormous stress. <clears throat> then he says, that's a question, a rhetorical question that he's going to answer. Then he says, let him show by his good behavior or honorable behavior which is being able to be wise and understanding under all conditions and under all stress test. Let him show by his good behavior and deeds that be divine production in the gentleness of wisdom. And then he introduces us to the demonic system, verses 14, 15, and 16. If you have bitter jealousy and selfish ambition in your heart as the target of the angelic complex do not be arrogant so and so lie against the truth that's the revealed word of God to you this wisdom is not that which comes down from above that would be divine wisdom but this wisdom is earthly natural which means I suppose sometimes it's translated unspiritual, natural or unspiritual, and demonic. For where jealousy and selfish ambition exist, like in verse 13, I mean 14, <clears throat> exist, there is disorder and every evil thing. And we talked about disorder being chaos. And evil, this is the devil's system. Then he talks where we're coming from tonight. He says, but the wisdom from above. Remember, he introduced that in verse 15. Agreed? <clears throat> but the wisdom from above, we call that divine wisdom. And then he 
he gives 10 examples of divine wisdom. One, it's from above. Two, it's pure. Three, it's peaceable. Then gentle, reasonable, full of mercy, good fruits, unwavering, without hypocrisy. And finally, the seed whose fruit is righteousness, sown in peace by those who make peace. There are 10 characteristics. If you recall from last time, we had 10 characteristics of the demonic wisdom, and we came back to 10 characteristics of divine wisdom. It's called from above, and, and, and as we'll see, one of the characteristics of it is from above. This word above is interesting. This is the word that was used with Jesus with Nicodemus. Uh, let show you that a moment. John, third chapter, in this discussion with Nicodemus, he hits this very issue we're talking about with Nicodemus. In the third chapter, <clears throat> third chapter of John, uh, two, three. He's in this discussion with Nicodemus. Um, he approaches Christ and refer, and calls him rabbi. You know we come. You you have we know you have come from God. As a teacher, that's from above, isn't it? You're a good teacher. For no one can do these signs miracles that you do unless God is with him. That's evidence. Jesus said, truly, truly, I say to you, unless a man, unless someone or one is born again, that's from above. If you have a study Bible, it might say it, or if you have another translation, it probably says it. You're born from above. That is the same word that's used there, born from above. And he tells Nicodemus, he said, well, you know, it's evidence by miracles and the way you live that you're, that you're from above, that you're connected with God uh, in a specific and a kind of interesting way that other people can see. Jesus said to him, truly, truly, I say to you, that's a big point of doctrine. Unless one is born from above, he offers Nicodemus a, a, an opportunity to join with him from above. Right? You see the above business. Nicodemus said, how can a man be born when he's old? And he goes to the natural, the unspiritual way of understanding this. He goes to the natural man or the, unnat or, or the uh, unspiritual way of that's the way you know where people are when you ask them spiritual questions, spiritual questions, and they give you unspiritual un un answers. <clears throat> Nicodemus said, well, how can a man be born? And so Jesus enters to this discussion again. Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water, he goes from above now into, because he's asked, Nicodemus is asking another question into the water. And then he goes into this pretty good discussion and, and uh, about being born. And he's talking about being born in a lot of different ways, but the key is from above. Down in verse 9, he says, how can these things, things be? And Jesus answered, and watch this answer in verse 10. You are a teacher of Israel and do not understand these things. That's a question. You know, it would be probably better. How is it that you're a teacher of Israel and do not understand these things? Truly, truly, I say to you, there we go again. We speak that which we know and bear witness of that which we have seen, and you do not receive our witness. Watch this now. If I told you earthly things and you do not believe, how shall, you, how shall you believe if I tell you heavenly things? See, he's made, th there you have it. It's exactly, you're in one of these two sp spheres, spheres of wisdom. If you're in the natural, then you're in the unspiritual, 
and it's demonic. The influence in it is demonic. And Jesus brings this up in him. And he does it in just the most polite way, doesn't he? And he, he follows uh, Nicodemus' questions with how he's going to respond to him. But he's in this, but listen to me, no matter what, he always brings him back to the gospel. No matter where he floats out with, because the natural man can't understand spiritual things. 1 Corinthians 2, 14 through 16, they don't have the mind of Christ. They can't touch the, the divine reasoning. They have to be born again. If you get born again, you will see these things. You will enter into these things personally. But you've got to be born again. So no matter where Nicodemus goes with this stuff, he always brings them back to the gospel, doesn't he? You've got to be born again. I mean, the fact that you're a great theological teacher and a very good guy, you still need to be saved. And the reason that you don't have a grasp on these things, he, and Jesus said, look, I'm talking about really simple things in the kingdom. Like, you got to be born again. <laughs> I mean, you don't have the, listen, you don't have the faith of your father Abraham right now. Galatians 3, 8. Abraham believed the gospel and was saved. See? And so, but Jesus nails these two spheres of wisdom. He's out of one, and Nicodemus is out. Jesus operating out of the divine system, and, and Nicodemus is operating as a religious, spiritual leader operating out of a demonic system. You understand that? And uh, that's a great example of these two spheres and the conflict and how you deal with it. Isn't that wonderful that Jesus laid that thing so simply out there for us so that we can understand you always, no matter where they flow, to enter into understanding these things. Got to be born again first. And being patient with them to give them the opportunity to discuss what they want to discuss and still bring them back is, is really about, about allowing the Holy Spirit to minister the gospel to people who have an interest in it but don't understand it. Even, listen, even spiritual, even religious leaders don't understand often spiritual issues. Nicodemus is a good example. Well, so gee, the, the, what we're discussing with James today is wisdom from above, which we call divine wisdom. It was one of the, one of the ten characteristics, point number one. Hey, you know, I thought it was also interesting. James writes the third chapter, and he, he introduces it in chapter one, in verse 1, in third chapter, verse 1 and 13, who he's talking to. And who he's talking to in, in third chapter, verse 1, are teachers and brethren. He's talking about, he's talking to the teachers of the church and he's talking to the congregation. Both need to really have clarity about this. I, th I thought that was interesting. And that's kind of what Jesus was dealing with with Nicodemus. I mean, sometimes we think that just because a person has a great deal of education and all kinds of uh, doctors this and masters that and all that behind their name, that somehow they probably know these things. And here's Nicodemus has got all those credentials like, like Saul of Tarsus. Don't have a clue. Don't have a clue. So it's always good to remember that. Never, don't matter if you're sitting in a group of of theological guys with doctorate, you always go to the gospel. Always go to the gospel. Well, I learned that from Mr. Graham. No matter who you're set, no matter if he puts you among kings or presidents or whoever he puts you with, give him the gospel. No reason, that, there's no other reason for you to be among that group. Whether he puts you with convicts or, or, or governors, Tell them the same thing. Well, that's interesting. And, and, of course, Jesus set a great example for that. I, I'm going to talk about the ten characteristics. I'm just going to hit them because you can go back and study them. I'm just going to identify them as James. James doesn't give you a lot of information. I'm going to try to give you a little more. But he calls it wisdom from above, and I illustrated that. Uh, this is new covenant divine wisdom. It, Christ issues it in. 
for us, it's with the completed canon of Scripture. I can't tell you how important that is. I run into people all the time that are into extra biblical, outside the Bible revelation as truth. And that's a very dangerous place to be. That's a very dangerous place to be. If you try to build your faith system off that, you're in a cosmic system. <laughs> that is not going to get you anywhere. Uh, you're in the demonic system. No, it doesn't matter if they present themselves as, uh, as natural or earthly. It doesn't matter. It's demonic run. The devil runs that system. Now, there's only two. So don't, don't forget that. The, the other word I thought was interesting that he identified in the English is called pure. Hagnos. And this, this the word, the, and, it, and it's a good word in the English because it means that it's without contamination, it's pure. It, you can drink this water. You know, often uh, the, uh, the water system will get polluted in some way, right? And they'll tell you don't drink it. Uh, or, or then they'll give you an update on it and say if you boil it for an hour, <laughs> I don't know how long you're supposed to boil it, uh, but... I ain't going to drink it anyhow. I ain't going to boil. I, now, I might, if I was in Mexico, lost someplace, but other than that, I'm just going to run down and get me a jug of water. Uh, but but the word pure is a, is a really a good word for hagnos. It means without contamination. Or for us spiritually, it means now that you're in the divine sphere of wisdom, uh, don't compromise the Word of God, the Word of God. Don't compromise the Word of God with any form of doctrines of demons. And I'll tell you, we're eat up with it in the South over one issue, and that's legalism. Legalism. They slip in these doctrines on legalism all the time into the church, and, 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 and they sell it with charismatic personalities, and people fall for it. They fall for it because of the, the personality. Boy, you got to be smarter than that. I mean, otherwise you're going you're gonna to buy a whole bunch of junk and store it someplace, aren't you? Because you, you buy things from personalities you don't need. But don't do it spiritually. Do not do that spiritually. And so I gave you uh, 1 Timothy. Actually, if you're going to get involved in it, you need to read the whole, ch the whole chapter 4. And, and he really gets after legalism. But in the South, just like Israel, the church in Israel always fights legalism, of course. In the South, you fight it. I mean, I can't, I, it's hard for me. The South has come out of a lot of things of legalism that were just not biblical at all. They were practicing legalism. It had no, for example, when I came to South, it was a sin to gamble. It was, a, it was a sin to dance. It, it was a sin to go swimming with the opposite sex in bathing suits. Now, I don't know what they thought you was going to swim in. I guess, it, I don't know. I don't want to go adventure. But, but, and I couldn't believe any of that. I couldn't believe any of that. I mean, even the natural man goes like, that's nuts. Couldn't play cards. Couldn't play cards. I got that, that, no gambling about it. Just couldn't play cards. And how do you get by not playing rook and old maid and game? How do you get by doing that? Man, you, you, you didn't live in the north because there's a long winters, boy. You better have a bunch of games going. Those are long winters. They hadn't been, right? William, there hadn't been games to play. We were done. Got it too long a winter. Then, then the third word is peaceable. It's kind of an interesting word. Peaceable. It's being conciliatory. You know, and listen, this word says being conciliatory is really good because you, you get internal benefits from it. Do you know how wonderful it is to forgive somebody else? how beneficial it is to you. And even if you have to be told to do that, like Ephesians 4.32, forgive 
others as you've been forgiven by God. Even if you have to be coached to do that, maybe pushed a little bit to do it, in the end, the benefits, if, if you do it with an honest about it, not working the game, if you do it with sincere sincerity in your heart about that thing, it just pays enormous dividends to your soul. It's so beneficial to love somebody else that doesn't love you. It's so beneficial to you to stay wholesome because when you don't, then you lose parts of yourself, do you not? You lose so much of yourself. And this is that word, peaceable. Be peaceable with people because peaceable is what you're after in you. And you know how you can do that? The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, and it. I mean, you can have this supernaturally. But when it comes out of wisdom and it comes out of growth and understanding, then it's, it's a powerful idea because it's, it's, you're not going to another power system in you. You're going to the power system of the Word of God in you. And that's a, that's a mature thing. It's a mature thing. And that's what he's after. For example, in Romans, the 12th chapter, verse 18, it says, listen to this now. It says, if it's possible... <laughs> We've all been in that part, I guarantee you. We're all of that age where we've been, if it's possible, as far as it depends on you. <laughs> I love the way he wrote that. Be at peace with everyone. <laughs> you love the way he said that. You know he's been there, if it's possible, as far as it depends on you. In other words, if, if, if for no other reason, do it for you. Be at peace. Listen, at least be at peace with you. You may not be at peace with the other person. You may not ever get at peace with the other person, but you can get at peace with you because you're not at peace with you. Do you understand that? Don't walk away without being at peace. Don't walk away from that until you have peace with you because you haven't walked away from it until you can do that. You wake up in the middle of the night and you're all bent out of shape. <coughs> eh? Don't have to be. At some point, you got to come to that place. Wisdom should tell you to do that. A wise man with understanding would know to do that. An immature baby wouldn't, but a mature man would. And listen, a mature man has access to divine wisdom that says, let's put this at, let's put this at peace. Let, let's put this at rest. How wonderful is that? Is that not, is that not beneficial for you? You can actually roll over, pull that pillow under your head and sleep. They used to say, sleep like a baby. Every once in a while, I get that. That's a foreign idea, but every once in a while, I get that. Gentle. Of course, gentle is the opposite of harsh. In 1 Timothy 3.3, 3, it says, watch this. It says, be gentle. And here's the word. Be gentle, not quarrelsome. Be gentle. Yeah, but you don't understand. I know. I understand this. Be gentle. I want to give, to give him a piece of my mind. Be gentle. Don't be quarrelsome. Are you going to do that to be quarrelsome? Don't get anywhere. Now, you, now you've said, let's duke it out. Now you said, I'm gonna, we're going to duke this out. I don't care. We're duking it out. Now you said, don't do that. There's no winners when you do that. Nobody wins. I don't care who knocks who down. Nobody wins. It's not a draw. It's not a win. It's a loss for both. And that's the word that's used here. It means to do the opposite of what you want to do. Do the opposite. Instead of being harsh, be gentle. Don't be quarrelsome. Don't look for a fight. I used to have the hardest time with this. 
with menop with uh, my daughters when they get got hormonal. I mean, there would there would be. I just finally finally learned that th there's no rhyme and reason. That when they grab it, <laughs> it would come out like that. <laughs> there's, I mean, there's no rhyme and reason to it, and so it really helped me. It really helped me to understand that because I didn't grow up with that. I I, I think maybe the reason I didn't grow up with it, I spent too much time in the field. <laughs> and not in the house but anyhow the the point is be gentle don't be what quarrelsome don't be and listen so often just the gentleness of it look let's just be calm let's be in the end it all works out on itself anyhow right the stuff you're going to fight about an hour later the good thing about aging is that you forgot what it was about I, I, you know, I used to hear that all my life. People said, I'll tell you, Ron, the benefit of hitting the 70 is who cares anymore? And um, I, I mean, you know, they tell jokes about going to the refrigerator and now why you went there, and then I'm there. You know, I, I, I'll find myself in front of the refrigerator and go like, what in the world am I doing in the kitchen? And so, you know, I usually go for something sweet. I get, I, you know, I'm probably supposed to get the milk and do something with it, but I don't know. I get ice cream because it's in the same family. And it just seemed like it would do better for me. And so I get me a bowl of ice cream. And yeah, now I know why I went to the kitchen. And then the Jane would say, well, where, where, you didn't bring me. And I go, oh, that's why I went to the kitchen. <laughs> ah, you're all going. Yeah, you. You'll laugh at yourself or else cry. It's better to laugh at yourself. Reasonable. This is interesting, too. Reasonable. What do you mean by reasonable? Well, this is kind of interesting because it means to be easy, easy to be entreated, ready to obey. But here's what I like about it. I, what I like about it is being flexible in manners in matters of liberty. Because you're going to run into that a lot. Now you find some of the others on the work at work and in in places where there's positions of authority. But when you read, now we're not going to do it tonight, but I want you to one one day read Romans 14. Pay a special attention to verse 1, 10, and 13. Because in this, it warns you about your liberty, you know, grace liberty that we have in Christ. Not to be so judgmental of people who don't understand liberty of grace. You know, the liberty of grace puts a lot of responsibility on you. It's a lot easier to live under the law than it is love, live under grace with liberty. Liberty is an enormous responsibility. You can, you know, you can, you can really see this principle. I've seen it now as a grandparent. Didn't pay attention when I was a parent with little kids and their boundaries. We want to, we want them to explore their boundaries as much they, and and not get in, not get in trouble. Because it's about it's about their freedom and their liberty and and their responsibility with it. And you try to coordinate. I want to give you I want to give you free reins. I want you to you know to be a range chicken. You know I want you to, but I don't want you to get eaten by a wolf. On the way to grandmother's house. So, th this is behind this word reasonable. Behind this word. But when you, read, when you read the first 13 verses of chapter 14, you want to pay attention because the, you always look for markers. And it's going to tell you in verse 1, 10, and 13, do not be judgmental. That critical spirit you have has got to be tempered. In, chapter, in verses 8 and 19, I'm going to quote verse 8. Here's how, here's how, and I love this verse, but listen, this is a very mature verse. I hear all kinds of people quote it, and I like, I like people quoting verses. Now, don't misunderstand me. 
this is one of those easy to quote and hard to live. That, you know, I say that all the time. Listen to what it says. And people quote this all the time. And like I said, I, it's a great verse to quote. It says, if we live, we live to the Lord. If we die, we die to the Lord. So whether we live or die, we belong to the Lord. See, he did a switch in there. He, he did something in there that people miss. Oh, they get it. For me to live as Christ and die as gain business. But he, he, he put a word in there. Listen to what he says. If we live, we live to the Lord. If we die, we die to the Lord. So whether we live or die, listen, we belong to the Lord. See, how you live deter is determined by how you understand you belong to the Lord. See, people don't really have an issue. Oh, well, when I die, I want to belong to the Lord. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That and that's true. But listen, that concept of belonging to the Lord in your daily walk, in your daily dealings with people and life and situations and circumstances is really important. That's if we live to the Lord. If you're going to live for the Lord as you're going to die for the Lord, then understand you belong to the Lord. 1 Corinthians 16, 19, and 20. Your bodies become the temple of God. Your body is no longer your own. You belong to the Lord. You belong to the Lord. You belong to the Lord, body, soul, and spirit. And that's what you want when you die, isn't it? It's exactly. Listen, if you don't, you still get it. But certainly that's what you want, to live it. I mean, belong to you belong to the Lord. That's why you live for the Lord. You belong to the Lord. That's why you die for him. And so I find that that's, that's found with this word. Then he's going to tell you, make every effort to lead a mutual, peaceful life. Mutual, live in mutual peace and mutual edification. And he's talking about how we edify one another. Now, let's rev it up a little bit. Suppose you're in a relationship with someone who never edifies you, tears you down in a heartbeat, but never builds you up. By edify, I mean build up. Build you up in the right way, not that phony baloney, ah, oh, baby, dang, yeah, you know he wants something. Not that phony baloney. Edify a person when that person needs to be edified, has every right to be edified, and other people would gladly edify them. Agreed? The Lord would certainly. The Lord always edifies you. The Word of God always edifies you. The, the Holy Spirit always edifies you. But if you're in a situation in your life, at work, in the family, whatever, where everybody is always tearing you down, never building you up. It's terrible parenting. It is terrible parenting. God, I deal with these kids all the time. Parents say, I don't know what I'm going to do with Johnny. He's 14. And I wish you'd have brought him when he was four. And then I could have talked to you guys. Always, when you're with somebody, it's always tearing you down. You know how difficult it is to always build them up? I mean, they tear you down enough. You, you get to watching their life, you know, if, 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 uh, building a hit list. Well, let me tell you, bud, you're not so, and what about this, and what about that, and what about this? And, see, you know, that, that, that gets you nowhere, and so you don't do it. Listen, burn the list. <laughs> Don't keep score. Burn the list. Because it does you no good to dwell on it. But let me tell you, be that person. 
be the wise, understanding person gives the other person a hand up. Right? Always give them a hand up. Always. And that's tough, isn't it? Can't do it in the flesh. You cannot do this in the flesh. And every once in a while, God brings a person like that into your life. This is not about you. It's not even the other person that's attacking you. It's attacking you all wrong, and it's not about that either. If it wasn't you, it'd be a dog. If it wasn't a dog, it'd be the backyard. If it wasn't the backyard, it'd be the car. If it wasn't the car, it'd be somebody else. It would be the gas station guy. It would be somebody, the doctor. It'd be this. It'd, be, it'd always be somebody. It's a character flaw. You pray that God will bring them to the place that you've been brought. Always a hand up, never down. Always a hand up. This is that word, and wise, pe- wise understanding people do this. You know why? Listen to me, because it, it works f- to keep your soul intact. It keeps your soul intact. Divine wisdom is for you. It's given to other people as a gift. Would be just like we go, like, I'll take a full glass of tea. And then they hand you one. I was standing in line the other day, and a guy came in and said, I'd like a I've always thought about this myself. He said, I want a glass of tea, no ice. Well, I thought to myself, I was standing behind him. I knew what he wanted. He wanted, full, because glass takes, the ice takes up half, half. I mean, that's the cheapest thing they got is ice. They fill it up, and then they, they, only, they only put a half, a half a glass of tea in there. This guy, the guy said, no, nah, I want the whole thing. Then he did something, and I'm standing behind him, and I'm going like, yeah. I got to have my tea. I got to have my tea ice. And then he says, I love this guy. I mean, I love this guy. And he said, I'll take a glass of ice. <laughs> Did you love that? God bless him. There's a guy that's going to retire with some money. <laughs> it don't let anybody get his money from him. That's smart. And I thought, I just learned a good lesson. I love that. Watch out, restaurants. Full of mercy. That's that word, full. Full, not partial. And, it, and the word mercy deals, it's a, when it's of God and the love of God puts mercy on the table when it is never deserved. I mean, and when you're saved by mercy, it is. And so I love this idea of mercy, being able to give people mercy when they deserve being run over by a semi-truck. That's a pretty good thing, not driving around over with a semi-truck, but <laughs> being able to give them mercy. I, I love Jesus in, in, in Luke, the sixth chapter, verse 36 says, be merciful. I love this because it's that reflection. Be merciful just as your father is merciful. In other words, forgive is forgiven. Love has been as you've been loved. Be merciful to people as mercy as God has been merciful to you. And I think, oh boy, he has been so merciful to me. I mean, he should, I would have been fried up like bacon so many times in my life, right? Just fried up like bacon. You know, I use that as an illustration. I, try, I cannot cook bacon. For the life of me, I cannot cook bacon. It takes too long. It, it, it takes way too long to cook bacon that's good, you know? I go in there and I, pff, wait, 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 and I, I, so that's my illustration. Number seven, good fruit. Good fruit. Good fruit. Is it, I, it takes patience. So I, my wife says it takes patience to cook bacon. I know. <laughs> I know. Aren't you so right? So, 
So, so what I do is I just take bacon off my menu. <laughs> Yeah. Oh, you could war and warm it up? Yeah. It already I don't know. Okay, okay, I'm off of bacon now. <laughs> good fruit. We're trying to help you. I know you are. God bless you. Now, good fruit, uh, it, w of course, we understand is divine production, the good part, agathos, God, God production or divine good. I love 2 Timothy 3, 16, 17. As you well know, I, I quote it all the time. All scripture is inspired of God. You know, inspired or God breathed, inhaled and exhaled in our life. The, the second part of that is really important. The second part of that, uh, uh, well, let me just read it. Let me just, let, let me just read the whole, the whole thing to you. In 2 Peter, I'm not going to get through my study anyhow. I knew when I had 10 things that it wasn't going to happen if I talked about them. Uh, third chapter, 16, 17, watch this. Uh, all scripture is part of God, inhaled, exhaled, profitable teaching, watch this now, profitable teaching for reproof, for correction, watch this now, for training in righteousness. Th these, are, these are three aspects, teaching, reproof, correcting, training in righteousness, these three things, when they work together, and they do, cha-ching, 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 they're, you know, they're sequential in your life, so that the man of God may be adequate and equipped for every good work. That's divine production. See, all Scripture is designed to take you there. It's all designed to take you. It's, it's to teach you, to reprove you, to rebuke you, to train you in righteousness. I love that idea to train you in the righteousness of God. So you have it positionally. This is about experiential righteousness that you have to be trained. And how does that come? Through Bible study. Inhale, exhale of the word of God. I, I just love that. I love that. And, and it gets us to divine production, see, which is the key behind it, the key behind it in the great plan of God. And so I find that to be kind of interesting. Uh, number eight is the unwavering. Now, this, this is, you can, it's without certainty. Unwavering is what we, is without, is, is without uncertainty in your life, without wavering. Uh, uh, James, James, this is what he calls a double-minded man in James 1, 8 and 4, 8. He calls a double-minded man is unstable. This is the idea behind it. Unwavering without uncertainties or indecisiveness or doubtful. That's that word. See, wisdom, the word of God, being when you're able to be wise in understanding the practical use of it in your life, what this does in this idea here is it takes away in your life the uncertainties. Well, I don't know whether to do this or that. Well, listen, we can figure that out. See, that, that's a wavering, isn't it? A wavering. An indecisiveness. What, what can I do? Well, here's what you could do. James 1.5. You could pray for wisdom. Because God is not God, God has one of those. You're not standing between two haystacks uh, without eating any and die because you couldn't eat like the horse you know that stood between two haystacks and died of starvation because he couldn't decide which one to eat. Well, they're both eat one of them and be okay. There's, uh, often our decisions are that way. But listen, James 1 5 says, ask, pray, pray for it. I, I later I'm going to talk about that, but not tonight apparently. Um, but James James one eight and nine talks about it. A, a double-minded man is unstable in his way, and then in James uh, four eight he says, therefore purify your heart, and it'll correct double-mindedness. It, it, it double-mindedness is just that. Well, I don't know whether I should do this or do that. Well, what's the Bible say? Well, I don't really have clarity on it. Okay, then what do you do? then you pray for, for it. God, give me the wisdom. I mean, you got it or it wouldn't come up. You know you have it. 
He wouldn't have brought it up and put it on your plate if you didn't have. Oh, the hunger is what put it on the plate. You hungered and thirst for righteousness, he put it on your plate. Now the exercise come is to put it into application. So often there is this a decision to hear and hear, and the only way to answer it is, is to seek God's wisdom about it. You, just like James 1, 5 says. We run into this a lot, don't we? We run into a lot right now in uh, the building and business and all that. You, you run across this and that. You go like, well, what are we going to do? And so you, you kind of settle and you run it. You look at this way and you look at it that way. You gather as much information and you still are in this. I think, what do you do? You sit down and pray about it and say, God, give me clarity on it. It's exactly what you do. And we all do that, don't we? We do it all the time. And what a smart thing that is. Yeah, you, yeah. Well, and, he, and it's his job. He wouldn't have put it on your plate if you didn't have the answers in your soul. But sometimes you just, it, they're just numbers and they're just stuff. And so you've got to back away from it, spend some time in prayer, then approach it again and say with clarity, and he'll tell you. It, he'll make it just as clear. I can see that happening right now in all this. I, I can see some very clear things happening, but I couldn't at first. I went back and I went, like, fine. Because it be between two haystacks. No, this isn't, one's not good and one's not bad. It said, I don't know, they're, they're both fair. <laughs> you know? Or they could be both very good. I mean, we, so what do you do? And, and the answer is you, you, go, to, you go to James 1, 5. That's the answer. And then 9, without hypocrisy, without partiality or pretense. You know, what we, the big word floating around today is transparency. That, that's a good word. It's just being be, being abused and misused, but, but transparency is what he's talking about here without partiality of pretense. I really love this. When I first, when I first uh, list, started listening to the colonel, colonel, he was in the book of Matthew, and I remember this really well, Matthew 7, and I, it, it stuck with me forever. And so when I find, I, I always go to this passage because it, I mean, he, he, the, the explanation of that was just phenomenal. <clears throat> and I didn't realize how much hypocrisy uh, is, I, it, it is in the Christian church and in my own soul. Hypocrisy. It, it's, it can sneak up on you, this hypocrisy, this pretense. The pretense. Uh, hypocrisy is playing, is an actor on the stage playing a role. That is not really you. You're just acting it out. It's not the real you. You understand that? And in this thing in, in Matthew 1, 5 through, uh, 1 through 5, one of the things that stood out in my mind when I, the first time I heard it, I went, whoa. <laughs> it says, by the standard of your measure, that's judging. It will be measured back to you. And I went, holy catfish. Whoa. Whoa. And then he gives the illustration of the speck and the log. That's a powerful idea. And you read that passage and walk away, and it, it grabbed you. It grabbed me, and he went like, man, you be, need to burn this out of your life, big boy. <laughs> Get rid of that. And finally, the tenth one is the fruit of righteousness. A lot of people struggle with this uh, understanding. What is, but I don't think our group will because we understand the difference between positional righteousness, experiential righteousness, ultimate righteousness. <clears throat> this is experiential righteousness. <clears throat> And it boils down <coughs> to the fruit. What is the fruit of righteousness? <coughs> the conformity, conformity to the directive will of God. You know, the faith cycle, you hear it, you believe it, you apply it, and you complete it. And that completing is that, that, that whole thing is the fruit, but it has to come into a completed element. You know, you can raise fruit. You got to wait for it, wait for it, wait for it, like frying bacon. You got to wait for it, wait for it, wait for it. And then when you think it's ripe, you know, there's a way to test whether it's ripe or not before it falls to the ground. 
<laughs> the secret is to figure out when. And and it's all like if it's an apple, it's all about the about the way it feels, the way it smells. And you give it just a tad bit twist. We raised them. You give it a tad bit twist, and it comes off easy, good. If it doesn't, leave it alone. And 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 pears are the same way, and peaches and uh, things of that nature. Um, we, we we raised a lot of 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 cherries. Uh, we had cherries. We raised a lot of cherries, and you pay attention to the birds. Your birds. You you know you can you know when they're ripe when the birds start f coming in. <clears throat> you go like, well, I think we better get them. Yep, they're harvesting them right now. And <clears throat> so that was a big clue to us. Conformity to the direct will of God, experiential righteousness in Christian life. And I love the way he says it here. He says. James says, is sown in peace by those making peace. And what he's talking about is the, and in our context, he's talking about the difference between bitter jealousy up in 13, bitter jealousy and what was the other? Bitter jealousy and strife. See, he, listen, instead of sowing that, let's be sowing this. Because this is a sign of wisdom, that's not. That's a sign. You know where he, you know where he put uh, bitter jealousy and strife. He put it in the sphere of demonic work, demonic wisdom. And he said that's not part of this one. This one here is sowing peace by those making peace. Um, and I gave you some passages. One you ought to pay attention to when we go, when you go there, is Hebrews twelve eleven. Now, I, I'm, I'm close to Hebrews. I'm going to grab that, and then we're going to close for tonight. Huh, I heard somebody say, yeah. Yay. Oh, it, I must have heard your thought. Is that possible? No, I don't think so. Boy, would I be dangerous if I could read thoughts. How did Jesus get to the cross and could read people's minds? How did he get there? I mean, I'd have been dead in the water. I'd have never made it past 12. <laughs> I'd have been gone. If I could have done that by the 12, I'd have been something. Verse 11, listen, to this in a divine discipline passage. You know, Hebrews 12, 5 through 11 is divine discipline. Here's how he summarizes that passage. It's a big passage now. Listen to what he says. All divine discipline for the moment seems to be, seems not to be joyful. <laughs> oh, boy. If you ever been there, you know that. <laughs> but sorrowful, that's a good end. Yet to those who have been trained by it, listen to that, trained by it. When God disciplines you, that's a learning experience for you. And he's saying, let's not, do, let's not keep doing this. And if you keep doing it, he revs it, revs it up a little bit on you, doesn't he? Just like we do with kids. Because it's, it's going to lead to bad. The bad behavior leads to bad things, doesn't it? I mean, bad, bad things. Afterward, watch. By, by divine discipline, you're trained. Afterwards, watch this. Who thinks about afterwards? You're just so glad to get out from under the stick. Afterwards, it yields, watch this, the peaceful fruit of righteousness, our very idea. God is always after that, isn't he? He's after it. He wants you to produce it in the, in the, in the, out of divine wisdom, out of the word of God in your soul, out of choices you make because you want to live for God. You want to live for him. You want to live for him. You want to die for him. But even when he disciplines you, he does it out of love and he does it out of correcting and he's training, always training you to be the character of person that his son died for you to be. That's a marvelous idea. Well, there's two other points for you to study sometime in your life. They're pretty good or I wouldn't have put them on your paper. Sometime I may come back to him. I don't know.
Well, let's close in a word of prayer, and we'll let the gentlemen leave us that have, and ladies that have been come to us by internet. For those who, uh, m those who might live out in the Moody, greater Moody area, we're at Rosenblum's house on Tuesday nights in the life of Joseph. We encourage you to come and be with us. We'll be there for a while. And, um, And you, I think you will. I think you will find an, an enjoyable study out of the book of Genesis, thirty-nine. Well, Father, we're thankful tonight for these that have come our way. Pray the Holy Spirit would minister the truth of the things that we have discussed tonight. That we would be gather a lot of information tonight. We've been all over that, but James listed the ten, and we needed to honor that. And explain it to our people in, in ways that maybe we could, you know, wrap ourselves around it and understand it. And I, I pray, Father, what has been neglected in this study will be encouraged by the Holy Spirit in, in the life of each of us. I thank you for that in Jesus' name. Amen.